Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Hey, hey, howdy, folks. It is Monday, July 15th, 2019. And we are here live on reallibertymedia.com rlmradio.xyz tunein.com internet radio we're out there we're on freedomsnetwork.com and uh, realliberty.org oh heck a variety of other places anyway welcome to everybody out there hopefully y'all had a good weekend it's Monday 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 (laughs) oh boy what a a fun day it is Uh, or was yeah I, I had a lot of good fun today let me tell you uh, the, uh, one of, one of my, uh, cryptocurrencies that I use, the hemp coin or THC as it's commonly known. Um, yeah, they're doing a migration to a new platform, a Komodo based platform, which uses some kind of Zcash. Thing. It, it doesn't matter. It's all a bunch of technical crap. Uh, just let me just say major cluster there, boy, that thing's been a pain in the butthole. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> hopefully they get it straightened out because the way it is right now, you got to be a technical whiz kid in order to get the thing just working. And uh, most people are not real happy about the whole thing. Most of the people I've seen in their Discord chat anyway, it's been it's been a... Whew. Anyway, so I spent hours taking care of that today. <laughs> anyway, let me say hi to all the folks over here in the chat room on irc.freenode.net in the pound pound real liberty media chat room channel irc channel as they're properly known and uh, we got a good group of folk over here today chatting it up to having a good old time we got the barman of course mr beetle cowboy tech myself and the moose girl mr dc uh, anti and asmo and beth z Free enslaved Miss Gramsey. Hey, Grammy! We got uh, Java Doctor and Meister Brow in the Ponder Gander. Uh, we got Miss Kate in Rob Works. Mr. Romes in uh, the Vanna White Bot. Vincent Easley. Uh, Weather Dork Bot. Uh, we got uh, Phantom and Circle. And Circle, you still here? You still awake? Hey, Circ. Uh, we got Cyborg Noodle and End uh, Civ. Uh, uh, Flash, somebody, you awake, Flash? I don't know if these guys are awake. It's late where they are. We got the frumpt, frumpty guy. Uh, and Mr. Gary L. Hey, Gary, good to see you here. Jumping on in. Uh, we got Goober. Gooba. <laughs> Stirring up a little hate and discontent in the channel there by just being himself. We got Gromit and JJ's and Kiss and Prince. Uh, the Pwn Sauce there, yes, with, and the Sock Puppet. And Miss Van Meter. So, yeah, good old good old crowd that's in here. And there's uh, others out there listening in other places that are not necessarily here in uh, the chat. So, welcome to you all out there as well. It's been a warm one. Let me tell you, my little uh, desktop widget shows me 93 degrees. Although, oh, the next outside temperature monitor shows 94 so it's pretty darn close. Although the weather bot, weather dork, is only showing me like 89. Yeah, either way, pretty close. It's in the, it's in the high 80s, low 90s right here in uh, central New Mexico. I got a bunch of stories lined up for you. Hopefully you'll enjoy these as much as I enjoyed finding them and putting them in the list. We're kicking it off today with ZeroHedge.com story. From June 1st, 2019, via the Mass Private Blog. Oh, Gary wants to know as much going over on Discord. It all depends on what you got going, man. Um, I, I have a lot of stuff going on Discord. Most of your cryptocurrencies uh, have a channel there on the Discord now. So, um, yeah. So I've got a lot of stuff going on Discord. Not my own stuff, but but other people's stuff. And I jump in and I and I 
chat whenever I come across this issue, or, or if if any of those folks over there uh, come up with an issue that I could answer, I try to help out. Just the kind of guy I am. <laughs> I'm not always correct with my answers, but that's all right. At least it gives people something to do while they're waiting for a real answer. Anyway, <laughs> zero hedge here. June 1st. Police to use TSA-style scanners to spy on you in public places. Yep. TSA-style body scanners are coming to public spaces. And that should scare the hell out of everyone. They got a picture here of the Statue of Liberty covering her face with her hands. <laughs> Standing in front of a TSA woman. Anyway, it says, If you thought the NP NYPD's Z backscatter vans and the police mini-Zs were intrusive, you have not seen anything yet. Soon, nowhere will be safe from Big Brother's prying eyes as police prepare to use Hexwave. Look that one up. Hexwave to spy on people in public spaces. Last week, the Salt Lake Tribune revealed that the Utah Attorney General and law enforcement are partnering with, and get this name, Liberty Defense. Liberty, Def Liberty Defense. <laughs> A 3D image scanning company that makes its money from scanning the public in real time. I don't, I don't, I don't get where the liberty part of that is, guys. I, 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 I did I miss something there? Do I not understand the word, the meaning of the word liberty? 3D means capturing rich information, size, shape, depth about the detection space. It can detect any material that has a physical form. So I think we should all go ethereal. Uh, that way they can't capture us because we won't have a physical form. How about that? We'll try that. Uh, let's start with their name. Calling yourself a liberty defense is an affront to the liberty-minded, you and I, Americans. Eh, Americans. I don't know about that one. But we're here. We're living in, within the boundaries of the area claimed by the government, so I suppose that, according to them, makes us Americans. Uh, Liberty-minded Americans who do not want to be secretly spied on by Big Brother. I don't even know how secret it is at this point, but they're doing it. Their tagline, protecting communities and preserving peace of mind. That's the exact opposite of what this device does. I, I don't feel protected, and my peace of mind is certainly not preserved by what you guys are providing. Any device that is used to spy on the public is just that, a surveillance device. It is not a defense of your liberty. As Fox Now 13 reported, police will use Liberty Defense's hex wave to spy on people at mass gatherings like concerts, malls and stadiums. Hexwave could be deployed at mass gatherings like concerts, malls and stadiums, public transit stops, and government buildings, Bill Riker, Liberty Defense's CEO said. Over the past two years, I have warned people that TSA-style bo body scanners were turning public transit into mirror images of the airports by watch listing and flagging Suspicious, that means you, people. <laughs> but I could never have imagined that law enforcement would be putting them in malls and places of worship. I, I don't know why not, man. I, I could certainly imagine it. If you do not believe Fox News, then perhaps you will believe Liberty Defense, which openly admits that they want governments and businesses to put their 3D scanners in every public venue. Their challenge? Efficiently securing high traffic areas with multiple entry points, such as hotels, rooms, schools, airports, public transit systems, entertainment venues, and outdoor pedest pedestrian locations in a secure, non-intrusive manner? 
I think it's fairly well intrusive. I don't see anything non-intrusive about that. If you are still not sure about law enforcement's plans to scan the public, then perhaps you will take the Utah Attorney General's word for it. According to him, uh, the Memorandum of Understanding, police plan to use Hexwave to scan the public for two years in, but not limited to, uh, to start off with for two years. Yes, they are hexing us. It is sorcery. (laughs) <laughs> so uh, in areas uh, not limited to sporting and concert arenas, stadiums, Olympic venues, primary, secondary, and higher education facilities. That's right. They'll be scanning your kitties, Places of worship. Oh, hail Bob. Uh, facilities and property owned by or affiliated with faith entities. Don't these don't these churches have a say in the matter? Um, <laughs> government offices, buildings, and facilities, amusement parks. Are you amused? Uh, entertainment events, conventions, shows, and festivals. Moose girl. <laughs> Police will also use hex wave to spy on the public during non-business hours to get system exposure to the full range of potential operating conditions to include environmental frequency volume of use or other operating conditions to which hex wave would be subjected what does that mean it means that law enforcement will be measuring public resistance you and i to being scanned 24/7 Liberty Defense CEO Bill Riker worked for the Department of Defense and General Dynamics, which speaks volumes about their desire to put 3D scanners everywhere. It is unclear if Liberty Defense is a Homeland Security DOD front, but one thing is certain. Their desire to turn public venues into extensions of the police state could not be any clearer. The spread of surveillance devices helps private corporations and law enforcement track and identify everyone. It does absolutely nothing to stop tourism. I mean, terrorism. <laughs> we, we must stop, stop the spread of TSA-style body scanners before they are put in public transportation, convenience stores, public parks, etc. Well, I, 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 how? How are you going to stop it? Uh, how? I don't know. But he says you got to. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not doing Gab. I tried Gab at the very beginning, and it was just a big Trump fest, and I'm not going back there. Sorry, Vinny and Gary and any other Gabbers. I got, I got no interest in the Gab. They, 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 they disgusted me. <laughs> I think Hal talked about this article yesterday. And I haven't probably covered this exact article, but I've covered many other similar ones uh, to it here. This is on what's up with that.com about, uh, posted June 8th by Charles, the moderator, Ross McKittrick. This, this scientist proved climate change is not causing extreme weather. So the politicians attacked. And so, Many scientists who have the facts and know the truth remain silent because they don't want to be attacked. And can you blame them? (laughs) All right, so this week, the week of June 7th, anyway, uh, in Vancouver, Prime Minister Pussy-Ass Trudeau said the federal carbon tax, a key pillar in his government's control everybody's actions, I, I mean, climate policy, will help protect Canadians from extreme weather. Extreme weather events are extraordinarily expensive for Canadians. Are they? Are they, though? Our communities and our economy. He said, citing recent tornadoes in Ottawa and wildfires in Western Canada. That's why we need to act. And act now. And act at your expense. 
While members of the media may nod along to such claims, the evidence paints a much different story. Roger Pelkey, Jr., a scientist at the University of Colorado in Boulder, who, up until a few years ago, did world-leading research on climate change and extreme weather. He found convincing evidence that climate change was not, not, get that word in there, not, leading to higher rates of weather-related damages worldwide. Once you correct for the increasing population and wealth, he also helped convene uh, a major academic panels to survey the evidence and communicate their near-unanimous scientific consensus on this topic to policymakers. For his efforts, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, I hope you like that, that image there, circle pussy ass. <laughs> All right, uh, Pelkey was subjected to a vicious, well-funded smear campaign backed by, among others, the Obama White House and leading Democratic congressmen, culminating in his decision in 2015 to just get the hell out, just quit the field. A year ago, Pelkey told the story to an audience at the University of Minnesota. His presentation was recently circulated on Twitter, with so much misinformation nowadays about supposed climate emergencies, it's worth reviewing carefully. And by the way, if you really want to understand what a pussy ass is, just take a look at <laughs> Trudeau. <laughs> and uh, you could just look at his face and understand. Moving on. Pelkey's public presentation begins with a recounting of his, his rise and fall in the field. As a young researcher in the tropical storms and climate-related dangers, he reached the pinnacle of, academic, of the academic community and helped organize the so-called Hanukkah Consensus Statement, named after the German town where 32 of the leading scientists in the field gathered in 2006 to sort out the evidence. They concluded that trends toward rising climate damages were mainly due to increased population and economic activity in the path of storms. For example, let's say you move to the coast somewhere, to a place that when a, when a, when a uh, storm at sea happens, gets flooded, and you build your nice expensive house on the coast there, and a storm at sea happens. Your house gets flooded. Well, now there's more climate damage, climate caused damage, not because the climate changed, but because you moved to some place where the climate normally does that kind of thing. <laughs> not the climate necessarily, just uh, storms, you know, weather. It's just, just the way it works. Anyway, they concluded that trends towards rising climate just were due to the increasing population and economic activity in the path of storms that it was not currently possible to determine the portion of damages attributable to greenhouse gases, which, as I have mentioned on too many occasions, there is no such thing as greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are a myth. They do not exist. Gases do not cause temperatures to rise. Gases do not trap temperature within an area. It is a myth. But everything is based upon that very little phrase there, that two-word phrase. And even all of the people on the supposed against uh, belief in man-made climate change or global warming still use the phrase greenhouse gases. Quit using it. It's fake. It's, it's phony. It's false. All right. Anyway. Just so you understand, and I'll let you go through the rest of this, because you, you know that if you do something, <laughs> you know, if you move to the banks of the Mississippi and so it, it starts raining up in uh, above the area where you live, and, and suddenly this house that you built on the banks of the Mississippi get flooded, well, what are you, what are you, what are you thinking? If you live in New Orleans, which is below sea level, and a storm comes in, you may well get flooded out. 
if you get a hurricane down there, well, you know, that's where hurricanes happen. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dan, did he sneak in there? Howdy. <laughs> all right. Dan from 10 EC. All right, all right, all right. Okay, this article, where's the, where's the, where's the top of this article? This is really confusing here. The, the, oh, there it is. Okay. From news.sky.com. Posted on June 5th, 2019. Dozens of schoolboys infected with HIV after secret blood trial. Uh, just 16 of the boys who were infected during the trial are still alive. That's right. More than 50 boys were infected with HIV after being secretly enrolled in a trial of polluted blood products that infected the uh, that the, the infected blood inquiry has been told. The boys were all pupils at Trail Lars, I guess that's how you say that, college in Hampshire, a specialist disability school that offered places to hemophiliacs in the 70s and 80s. More than 80 of the hemophiliacs at the school who were given contaminated blood products as part of their treatment, just 16 are alive. Abe Goodyear, one of the survivors, told the inquiry of his, his records show that he was among a group of 50 enrolled in an eight-month trial of blood plasma. He said neither he nor his parents were informed that he had been selected for the trial of a new blood plasma made by U.S. pharmaceutical manufacturer Spaywood Laboratories. The blood products used to, pre to prevent the bleeding to which hemophiliacs are prone were dispensed in a purpose-built NHS-run clinic at the school. I believe everyone in this trial became infected with HIV, he told the inquiry. <clears throat> We don't know for certain if it was in the first eight months of the trial, but it was definitely in the, uh, in the American products because I was very sick from that batch. Mr. Goodyear, who was infected with HIV and hepatitis C, told the inquiry that after the trial, he almost only received American blood products, and a nurse at the clinic told him these products were responsible. She told us there was one batch that infected all of us boys. She didn't mean one batch. She meant there was one line of products. About 5,000 people have been infected with HIV and hepatitis C by infected blood products uh, used to treat hemophilia or from the transfusions of contaminated whole blood by the NHS. Nearly 3,000 of those 5,000 have died. The majority of infected hemophiliacs receive blood products imported from the U.S. made with blood sourced from prisoners, drug users, and sex workers. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're getting the good stuff there, ain't ya? Mr. Goodyear said his doctor was at the school at the school was racked with guilt after discovering that the blood products were contaminated. Maybe you want to test these blood products before actually injecting them into people. How about that? He described discovering the doctor weeping in his kitchen after being taken with another boy to his house for lunch. He said to us, we fucked up, we messed up. He called uh, on the inquiry to seek accountability for the decisions that led to so many of his peers being infected. Who made that man, the doctor, push HIV through our veins, knowing what he knew? Who directed him to do it? It guaranteed that we could get it for eight months. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Just the way they work. That's just the way they do things. Don't trust those people that call themselves doctors. Now, you all are familiar with uh, the right side team and the left side team. You know, the Soros team and the Koch team, or Koch team as I call them. 
and they're opposed to each other, right? They're they're direct opposites. The Kachas are the supreme right wing beings, and the Soros is the supreme left wing being, or so they'd have you believe. Charles Koch teams up with George Soros, Patreon, Airbnb to fight what? Online extremism. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here because I'm pretty sure that Soros is the cause or behind funding much of the left-wing extremism and Koch would be the same thing on the other side. Hmm. So they team up to fight something that they're causing? This can't be right. (laughs) Charles Koch is teaming up with tech companies, universities, and other fellow billionaires. Huh. Wonder who those guys could be. To combat online extremism. On July 17th, after the Charlottesville Project, will host its second summit in San Francisco, uh, founded in the aftermath of the deadly 2017 white supremacist attacks in Virginia. Now, wasn't that all disproven? The white supremacist attacks in Virginia. Wasn't that all disproven? Anyway, the conference brings together political and business leaders to discuss solutions for curbing political terrorism. Who? Shelley was the new right team king? I, I, I don't know who that is. <laughs> All right. Well, while last year's gathering in Missouri involved grassroots and city response initiatives, the focus of this year's summit will involve private tech sector and best practices on the fight against hate and extremism online. Again. Is, 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 is what? Aren't, aren't these the guys, the drivers behind these things? Representatives for the Koch Institute and the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, another huge hate-mongering group. Yeah, I mean, the, the ADL is probably the biggest hate group out there. Anyway, they will join executives from tech companies, which currently include Eventbrite, Mozilla, Pinterest, Patreon, and Airbnb. Is Airbnb really that big of a... I, I, I just thought they rented... Let you let you rent your rooms. I I didn't think it was that big of a thing. I, I, what do I know? Anyway, uh, now more than ever is the time to create communities that value diversity, inclusivity, and positive change. Excuse me while I barf a little in my mouth. Yeah. Uh, Michael Siner, the former mayor of Charlottesville... Virginia and the founder of the chairman of the Communities Overcoming Extremism Project. Communities Overcoming Extremism Project. Ugh. <laughs> Said in a statement, we're excited to assemble with these forward thinking tech leaders to explore what positive outcomes we can gain uh, from an event of powerful conversations. Really? Really? Anyway, this past year, tech companies have cracked down on online extremism. No, they haven't. That, that, that's, that's a massive lie. They've cracked down on people whose opinions they don't like, but they have not cracked down on any actual extremism. And I, I experienced a lot of extremism a couple weeks ago right there on the Twitter. <laughs> yeah, massive extremism. And not a word from the Twitter about that. Anyway, often met with mixed successes. Last week, Vox reporter Carlos Maza accused Google's YouTube of enabling harassment on its platform by allowing conservative media star Steven Crowder, he's a star, to insult him as a lispy queer. Well, is he? I don't know who Carlos Maza is, but I have to ask, is he a lispy queer? Anyway, to his 3.8 million followers, the the campaign resulted in YouTube deciding to demonetize Crowder's YouTube videos, though many progressive activists believe the company 
should have removed his page altogether. And after the Charlottesville project is sponsored by the Comcast NBC Universal, the Kresge Foundation, and the Soros Fund Charitable Foundation. <laughs> Oh, God. Anyway, it says there's, there's a correction here. The original version of the article stated that the Koch brothers were involved with the After Charlottesville project and included an image of David Koch. Uh, this, this piece has been updated to reflect that only Charles Koch is involved. All right. I, I, I you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what to say about it all. It just, it just it's, it's, it's like, th this is... I mean, George Orwell could never even think of something as perverted as a way of perverting the language and the behavior of people like these people are doing. Orwell's looking up there and saying, damn, I thought I was being extreme right in 1984. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not so much, George. <laughs> uh, let's see. I am Lone Frog says Stephen Crowder dresses in drag. Does he? Mm -hmm. All right. And hangs out with Rudy uh, Rudy Giul Giuliani, who also dresses in drag. Okay. So what are they doing? Some kind of. Uh... <laughs> uh, never mind. <laughs> All right, this here on uh, Mint Press News from September September 20th, 2016. Going back a little. Posted by Jason Ditz. Still, this happened then, and you can bet it's still happening now. Maybe not this exact thing, but other things just as evil. The United States admits to supplying Saudi Arabia with white phosphorus munitions. You know, those banned things, those things that are nobody is supposed to be using, but that the United States does use and Israel does use. Oh, yeah, the U.S. gave, gave those to uh, Saudi Arabia. The United States has faced growing pressure in recent months over the arms sales to Saudi Arabia, as their airstrikes in Yemen have caused massive numbers of civilian casualties. Uh, amid new evidence that Saudi Arabia has begun to use white phosphorus munitions in their war in Yemen, U.S. officials are admitting that the weapons were provided by the U.S. That's your tax dollars at work. Uh, they declined to say when or how many weapons were provided. White phosphorus, uh, white, white phosphorus munitions are heavily restricted in their usage under international law, allowed to be used only for so smoke screens and signaling, but their incendiary properties and the risk of inhaling the smoke has made their use as an offensive weapon effectively a war crime. So the U.S. admitted to war crimes. The State Department said any country given the munitions was accepted, ac accepted or expected, what? To use them only in accordance with international law and promised to look into the reports of Saudis improperly using the munitions during the Yemen war, says saying the United States would take appropriate actions uh, appropriate corrective action if this is true. Well, the United States does it too. So how is the guy, the bad guy, doing the bad thing, providing the other bad guy with some of those those weapons to do the same bad thing, going to be taking a look at this to, uh, uh, pro to make sure that appropriate corrective action is done? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't even... I, you know, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> yeah. As if Yemen really had a way to fight back against Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, in, in the first place. They're just, they're poor. They, they got nothing. They don't have any big backers. 
like like uh, the United States behind them or, or, or Russia. Although people try to say Russia is involved with them, they're not. All right, this article posted June 11th here on Activist Post by uh, Michael Mahari, I guess that's his name. M-A-H-A-R-E-Y, okay. Signed by the governor. Four new laws will expand Colorado marijuana markets despite federal prohibition. So screw you, feds. <laughs> I don't I don't like the governor. Well, I didn't like the previous governor either. They're up there in Colorado, but this guy's even worse. But I, I'm not going to disagree with him on this particular move. Uh, anyway, this month, or last month now, Colorado Governor Jared Polis signed four bills in the law that will expand the legal marijuana market in the state despite the federal prohibitions. House Bill 1230 legalizes limited on-site sales and consumption of marijuana in licensed public establishments. See, you shouldn't have to be licensed. And uh, you should not need government permission to allow that. But whatever. Uh, the It's better than what they have right now. These include restaurants, hotels, music venues, and other businesses. Dispensaries, which... Why dispensaries? Why aren't they just like stores? Will be able to open uh, uh, tasting rooms. The law also authorizes marijuana tour buses. woo And limos. <laughs> Marijuana tour buses, party bus, establishments running the vehicles can't sell cannabis. Well, why not? But marijuana consumption is allowed in them in a bring your own weed system, which cool. (laughs) House Bill 1234 legalizes marijuana delivery. So give me a pizza and an ounce of uh, something fine. This service will be available for medical marijuana patients with red cards huh? in uh, January 2020. And in January 2021, recreational shops and third-party delivery services will be able to begin operation. Why the delay? Why, why, you signed the bill. Why not just do it now? What's the, what's the hold up here? Cities, towns, and counties can ban delivery services under the law. And why allow that? You're the big state boys. Why don't you tell the cities, towns, and counties they cannot ban delivery services? Anyway, uh, still, better than what they got now. You can have it delivered in 2021 with your pizza. House Bill 1090 opens up Colorado's cannabis industry to the outside investor and capital including publicly held companies and large venture funds. So gather up your cash and invest in Colorado's cannabis industry. House Bill 1311 creates the Institute of Cannabis Research at Colorado State University Pueblo. Uh, The role and mission of the Institute are to conduct research related to cannabis and public and publicly disseminate the results of the research. With Governor Governor Polis' signature, the laws will go into effect August second, twenty nineteen. But you still got a delay on on the uh, del- delivery part. Uh, I guess you'll be able to go into a place and and uh, smoke weed in some of those places, um, and and you'll be able to get on the party bus and things like that. So the effect on federal prohibition, they talk about that, you know, um, which I I don't really care about and nobody else should ever care about either. Uh, Well, uh, in Colorado Circle, you are allowed to grow your own. So um, there is that there. Uh, A limited amount. You're allowed to grow a limited amount of your own. You can't just have a farm in your backyard a marijuana plants, but you can have four, four mature plants, and I think four middle plants, and and four seedlings, or so, something like that. They got some real weird, real weird rules about how you can grow your weed, and then how much you can have that is either dried and or drying. <laughs> it's kind of messed up, but you are allowed to grow your own up there. And if I lived up there. 
I would definitely be growing some of my own. Now we're going to go back, way back to 1977. 1977. Uh, this is posted originally on the New York Times.com. However, it is available now on archive.is. Uh, and I will post you the link here. The link will be in the post-show blog as well. CIA data shows 14-year-old project on controlling human behavior. About the archive. This is a digitized version of an article from the Times Print Archive before the start of an online publication in 1996. To preserve these articles as they originally appeared, the Times does not alter, edit, or update them. Occasionally, the digitization process introduces transcription errors or other problems. And uh, it gives you a link there in case you find anything that wasn't accurate. Not that you would remember reading a newspaper from 1977. <laughs> anyway, Washington, July 20th, 1977. The CIA conducted a 14-year program to find ways to control human behavior through the use of chemical, biological, and radiological material, according to the agency's documents made public uh, that day by John Marks, a freelance journalist. Mr. Marks, an associate uh, for the Center for National Security Studies, asserted at a news conference that Admiral Stansfield Turner, director of the C Central Intelligence, I guess that's agency, but it's just a Central Intelligence there, um, in a letter to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence last week, seriously distorted what the CIA research programs involved. Mr. Mark said that based on documents about the program he had received under the Freedom of Information Act, he con that he had concluded that Admiral Turner seems to be practicing what used to be called a modified limited hangout, where he called the agency's activities a program of experimentation with drugs. To be sure, drugs were a part of it, he said, but so were other techniques such as electric shock, radiation, ultrasonics, psychosurgery, psychology and incapacitating agents, all of which were referred to in documents I have received. The documents made public today and the disclosure by the CIA last week that it had found another cache of previously undiscovered records suggested broader experimentation on unwitting humans by the intelligence agency or its paid researchers than had been publicly known before. Mr. Mark said he had obtained or read about a thousand CIA documents, many of which were never turned over to the Senate Intelligence Committee for its 1975 investigation of agency activities. CIA spokesman declined to comment, imagine that, on Mr. Mark's charges. However, Admiral Turner told Newsman after leaving a meeting with senators that the agency was moving swiftly to review the documents it had found. So it's like it didn't even know what it was itself was doing. Uh, Mr. Marks distributed 20 documents described in the following uh, incidents, among others. In 1956, the CIA contracted with a private physician to test bulpocanine, bul bulpocanine, I don't know, a drug that uses... That, that can cause a stupor or in, induce a catatonic state on monkeys and convicts in convicts incarcerated at an unnamed state penitentiary. The agency wanted to know, uh, wanted to known, wanted to know if the drugs caused the loss of speech in man. Maybe they're doing it to me. I'm kind of having a loss of speech here myself. Uh, loss of sensitiv sensitivity to pain, loss of memory, loss of willpower. A letter from an unnamed CIA official in 1949 discussed ways of killing people without leaving a trace. I believe that there are two chemical substances which would be the most useful, the most useful, the most useful, 
in that they would uh, leave no characteristic pathological findings and the quantities needed could be easily transported to places where they were to be used. The letter said, the letter also suggested exposure of an individual to x-rays or to an environment in which he would freeze to death. <laughs> God, these people are fucking vicious. Oh, man. If these methods were too difficult, two methods needing no special equipment, the letter said, would be to smother a victim with a pillow or to strangle him with a wide piece of cloth, such as a bath towel. In 1952, Russian agents who were suspected of being doubled were interrogated using narco narco-hypnotic methods. Under medical cover, the document said uh, the, the two men were given sodium pentothal and a stimulant. One interrogation produced a remarkable regression, uh, the paper said, during which the subject actually relived certain past activities of his life, some dating back 15 years, while, in addition, the subject totally accepted, uh, Mr. Name Deleted, as an old, trusted, and beloved personal friend, whom the subject had known in years past uh, in Georgia, in the USSR. A summary of the 1953 meeting reported a suggestion that the CIA work with scientists on unidentified foreign government uh, since that country allowed experiments with anthrax, a disease contracted from infected cattle, sheep, and, oh yeah, certain laboratories in the United States. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, the uh, article goes on there, but uh, bear in mind, when somebody says to you, that could never happen here, it has happened here. It is happening here. It will continue to happen here. Make no mistake about it. We get a sip of water right quick here. Now, I know I talked about this in chat. I don't know. I don't think I talked about it on Freakers or or Leftovers yet, but I know I talked about it in chat. Because it's absurd. <laughs> of course, aren't these all absurd? I mean, these are all real, quote, quote, real news that's out there. And they're all freaking absurd. <sighs> Top U.S. regulator warns financial system is at risk due to climate change. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Goober, it is more like a 70-year-old project now. Anyway, so here it is, from uh, submitted by Nick Cun Cunningham of oilprice.com to, to Zero Hedge on the 14th of June. A top U.S. financial regulator is worried that climate change, the boogeyman, oh, could threaten global financial markets. Rostin Benham, a commissioner at the Commodities Future Trading Commission, the CFTC to you and I, said that the financial system was at risk from the growing frequency and severity of storms. I probably should have covered this back when I was talking about the other article when the guy said, hey, there is no frequency, growing frequency or severity of storms. It's all nonsense. <laughs> but this guy goes on to say, the impacts of climate change affect every aspect of the American economy. From, uh, well, you know, it, uh, so, would, so, so would an ice age. An ice age would really affect it. Now, if it was actually warming, as, be, as we're being told, that would be a benefit, a boon to the economy because you'd have longer growing seasons in larger growing areas. And, and uh, people would do much better with a couple extra degrees. But we're not getting that, so sorry. Anyway, so uh, 
<laughs> so he says, from production agri uh, agriculture to commercial manufacturing to financing of every step in each process, Benham said at the meeting of the CFTC's Market Risk Advisory Committee on Wednesday, as most of the world's markets and market regulators are taking steps toward assessing and mitigating the current potential threats of climate change, we in the U.S. must also demand action from all segments of the public and private sectors, including this agency. He added, our commodity markets and financial markets that support them will suffer if we do not take action to mitigate the risk of contagion. This guy is so messed up, so messed up, and just spewing nonsense and hoping people believe him. The message is not necessarily a new one, but it is, a, is significant since it comes from the CFTC, which is not exactly a hippie enclave. Also <laughs> of significance is the fact that Benham was opposed, uh, appointed to the CFTC by Mr. Trump, although by law the vacancy that he filled had to be a Democrat. So is the guy a Democrat? We don't know. I mean, people could say they're this, that, or the other thing, but we don't really know what's going on inside their head, their beliefs. But from his words, I would say he, he leans to the progressive side. So Ben Hamill set up a panel of experts to study the risk of, to the financial system from climate change, which you can't measure something that doesn't exist. How do, how do you measure nothing? <laughs> If climate change causes more volatile, frequent, and extreme weather events, you're going to have a scenario where these large providers of financial products, mortgages, home insurance, pensions, cannot shift risk away from their portfolios. Good, you're safe. No luck. No, I mean, no, no risk. No problem. Um, uh, Benham said that the world saw $160 billion in economic costs last year from natural disasters. No, those those were not natural disasters. Anyway, more recently, the United States Midwest is facing a, a crisis with biblical levels of flooding. <laughs> really? Is, is somebody out there building an ark right now? Because if you're having biblical levels of flooding, you, you better be building an ark and throwing them animals up there on it because, you know... <laughs> <laughs> and they say, and he goes on to say, that have decimated American farms. Well, in case you're unaware what the word decimated means, it means to reduce by one-tenth. Which I don't think that's what his intended meaning was, but the word decimated is not mean what most people think it means, and it's not means... Uh, mean what most in the way most people use it to say something was completely destroyed. Decimated means uh, look at the word deca ten. <laughs> it means re to reduce by one tenth. That's what that means. Anyway, the type of disaster that is expected to become more frequent. Financial regulators have begun to pay greater attention to the risk of climate change. <sighs> A global network of nearly 40 central banks have formed network for the greeting the financial system. Greeting the financial system, or NGFS. An initiative intended to manage risks and to mobilize capital, capital for green and low-carbon investments. Because they're still thinking somehow that carbon dioxide, which you breathe out, and trees and other plants breathe in, is somehow a problem. Absolute nonsense. If climate change presents threats to global financial system, that is, then if it does, then it is imperative that central banks prepare for such dangers. But it doesn't. So there's nothing to prepare for. The NFNGFS recognizes that there is a strong risk 
that climate-related financial risks are not fully reflected in asset valuations. So this could just be a scam, a, a way to get to to reduce what they the way they value your property. Um, yeah, could be that. <laughs> All right. Anyway, the article goes on and on. No, not not that much further, but it goes on a bit more, describing to you the nonsense that they uh, want to push down your throat. Anyway, we'll close up with this next article here because this could be important. I know out there in the listening audience are certain people, certain people that eat salad. (laughs) I'm not one of those people, but I know there's certain people out there that eat salad. However, this goes beyond salad. It goes into the, the full line of produce. And it's something you all know, but here it is anyway. This posted by Aaron Elizabeth on June 12th on healthnutnews.com. The article entitled, When Salad Turns Toxic, When Salad Attacks, Pesticides in 70% of U.S. Produce. That's the problem, or that is a problem. It's a huge problem. But it's a problem. And it's re- actually written by Joseph Mercola. You all know Mercola.com. Yeah. Everyone loves a fresh garden salad, but are you sure the ingredients you're using, the vegetables and fruits, are as healthy as they appear to be? You may need to take a closer look. According to an analysis conducted by the EWG, the Environmental Working Group, based on the U.S. Department of Agriculture data, Pesticide residues have been found in up to 70% of fruits and vegetables sold in the good old U.S. of A. This should not be surprising considering that at least 1 billion pounds of conventional pesticides are used in the country every year. And it highlights the disturbing reality of just how ubiquitous pesticides have become in our food supply. Take kale, for example, dubbed a superfood because of its impressive list of nutrients. It's now been put under scrutiny after 92% of the samples were found to be carrying two to 18 different types of pesticides. This leafy green once hailed as the new beef due to its outstanding protein content now ranks third in the EWG's Dirty Dozen list. Yeah, that's right. Half of it's radiated as well. Uh, At least half. Yeah. Um, As well as your meats are also radiated. As well as uh, anything they can do to try and poison you, they do. I'll I'll, I'll let you read the balance of that article yourself. Um, Like I said, not new information, but there it is for you. So, uh, (laughs) the hell. Oh, man. Anyway, this has been episode 31 here in week 29 of 2019 of the Grim Leftovers program. Uh, I will be back again next Monday with another episode, episode 32. And uh, hopefully you'll be back with me at that point in time. Um, now, tonight, six hours from now, uh, right here on RLM Radio, we'll, you'll have Flash Somebody doing his show in a perfect world. Uh, maybe Vinny will stay up and join him. Who knows? Uh, any, anyway, on Wednesday and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, Grammy's Rocket Chair with Miss Gramsie. Doing, she, she, she does a great show. It's fun stuff. Uh, Flash is on Thursday at um, 2 p.m. afternoon uh, doing 20% off. Uh, Vinny will not be on on Friday doing his normal show. Uh, Moose Girl will not be here Friday night. So it will be me doing balls to the wall instead of the Frickers ball. Dork tables on Saturday at noon. Blues are on Sunday at noon. Hal's on Sunday at 3 p.m. These are all Eastern times, by the way. But thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I've had a good time sharing the bad news. (laughs) The grim news. The grim leftovers with y'all. All All right, y'all have a great evening, and I'll talk to you later. Peace.